all poetry has something in common with music. Part of what makes poetry different from prose is that it uses words not only for their meaning, but for their sound. In this talk, I will look at Sherbindo's epic poem, Solitary, from this point of view, as word music. Sri Aurobindo uses the Sanskrit term mantra in the Vedic sense for an intensity of rhythmic expression where poetry becomes incantation. In solitary itself, there are passages that give a sense of what it is like to channel this kind of inspired poetry. There is a canto called The Quest, where the heroine travels across ancient India, passing through the ashrams of the sages. Here, the depiction of how the hymns of the Veda were composed by the rishis seems to be based on Sri own experience. Intuitive knowledge, leaping into speech, seized, vibrant, kindling with the inspired word, hearing the subtle voice that clothes the heavens, carrying the splendor that has lit the suns, they sang infinity's names and deathless powers in meters that reflect the moving worlds, sights, sound waves breaking from the soul's great deeps. The last line both defines and illustrates what Sherbindo means by the mantra. I will come back to this line a little later and look at it more closely as an example of word music. But first, let me say something about meter and rhythm in general. In the future poetry, Sherbindo uses the same image of sound waves when he writes, Rhythm is the premier necessity of poetical expression because it is the sound movement which carries on its wave the thought movement in the word, and it is the musical sound image which most helps to fill in to extend, subtilize, and deepen the thought impression or the emotional or vital impression and to carry the sense beyond itself into an expression of the intellectually inexpressible. Poetry does not have to be metrical to have rhythm, but Sherbindo felt that there is an enduring truth behind the use of meter. He explains, when mankind found out the power of thought and feeling thrown into fixed and recurring measures of sound to move and take possession of the mind and soul, they were not discovering a mere artistic device, but a subtle truth of psychology, of which the conscious theory is preserved in the Vedic tradition. According to the Vedic theory, the meters of Sanskrit poetry reflect in some way the cosmic rhythms, evoked in these lines in the third canto of Solitary. Inaudible to our deaf mortal ears, the wide world rhythms wove their stupendous chant to which life strives to fit our rhyme beats here, melting our limits in the illimitable, tuning the finite to infinity. Vedic meters may have echoed the music of the spheres, but Sherbinder was working in the modern, secular, Western tradition of English poetry. However, he was stimulated by the challenge of adapting the English language and its metrical resources to the expression of his mystic vision. With regard to the potential of English as a language for the poetry of the future, he wrote, we have the fortunate accident of the reshaping of a Teutonic tongue by French and Latinistic influences, which gave it clearer and more flowing forms and it turned it into a fine though difficult linguistic material, sufficiently malleable, sufficiently plastic for poetry to produce in it both her larger and her subtler effects, but also sufficiently difficult to compel her to put forth her greatest energies. On the whole, therefore, it is here among European tongues that there is the largest present chance of the revolution of the human spirit finding most easily its poetic utterance. It is also here, by the union of a great vital energy and a considerable possibility of the spiritual vision, 
that there may be most naturally a strong utterance of that which most has to be expressed, the seen and realized unity of life and the spirit. English and its literary tradition provided Sherbido not only with the language in which he wrote, but with the meter he used in solitary. This is called the iambic pentameter, and at first sight it looks most unpromising. Pentameter means that each line can be scanned metrically as five feet. In iambic pentameter, you would expect each foot to be an iamb, that is, a short syllable followed by a long one, or an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed one. This would give the pattern da 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 If that was the whole story, the iambic pentameter would be a formula for intolerable monotony in a poem of any length. But in fact, the five iambs function more as an underlying pulsation than as a metrically, mechanically repeated pattern. In the hands of a skilled poet, this rigid-looking framework permits endless, subtle variations in the actual rhythm. Now, a purely iambic line here and there can be very powerful. Take, for instance, the line in which Savitri replies to the nihilistic arguments of the god of death with a series of five affirmations manifesting her indomitable spirit. I am, I love, I see, I act, I will. A somewhat more typical iambic rhythm is heard in a line that occurs in the last canto of the Book of the Traveler of the Worlds, where Asrapati has ascended to the overmind plane of cosmic consciousness. He thought and felt in all, his gaze had power. Another line in the same canto illustrates the fact that breaks between words do not always correspond to the metrical scansion. He rode the lightning seas of cosmic mind. The words lightning and cosmic have a trochaic falling rhythm, though metrically the line is iambic. A striking example of the interplay between the iambic meter and a trochaic word rhythm is found in the Book of Fate. An awful silence watches tragic time. Here there are four words in a row with a trochaic rhythm, although metrically the line consists of five iambs. But such lines where the iambic rhythm is completely regular are the exception rather than the rule in most English poetry, including solitary. In practice, the repetitive metrical scheme not only allows but virtually requires the pattern to be varied by substituting other feet for iambs, so long as the sense of an overall iambic movement is preserved. In the English pentameter, these are some of the metrical feet most commonly used. The iam supplies the basic rhythm. An anapest is an iam with another short syllable added at the beginning. A pyrrhic consists only of two short syllables and a spondy of two long ones. The trochee is the reverse of an iam, and the dactyl is the reverse of an anapest. Another pattern which sometimes occurs is the bacchaeus, defined as short, long, long. Of course, one doesn't have to know all these terms to read Shrivido's poetry, but they can be useful for understanding and explaining its rhythm. The availability of all these modulations of the iambic rhythm makes the pentameter, in practice, a very flexible meter with almost unlimited expressive possibilities. At the other extreme from lines with five iambs, Lines with as few as one I am are not uncommon in solitary. Take this line about time, for example. It's inevitable and continuous stream. 
Here, a flowing movement is achieved through the predominance of short syllables with anapests and pyrrhics replacing iams in all but the fourth foot. Three of the other feet, a troche, a dactyl, and a spondy, occur in this line, giving it a very different rhythm with an iam only at the end. Silence, swallowing life's acts into the deeps. In this example, the restless activity of the mind is suggested by the busy rhythm of a line in which the single iam is followed by the somewhat less common bacchaeus, short, long, long, in the third foot. All is a hundred-toned murmur and babble and stir. So we, we begin to see the range of expressive variations available within the simple framework of the iambic pentameter. This is how Shurabindu explains the rationale of the whole system of accentual verse in English. What we really have is a system of recurrent strokes or beats intervening at a fixed place in each foot, while the syllables which are not hammered into prominent place by this kind of stroke or beat fill the interspaces. A regular metrical base is thus supplied but the rhythm can be varied or modulated by departures from the base, from it, but always upon it. Inherent quantity, combined with distribution of stress, is used as an accessory or important element of the rhythm to give variety, subtlety, deeper significance. The last sentence introduces the factor of quantity as opposed to stress. Quantity and stress are key terms for grasping the subtleties of the rhythm of solitary. In his essay on quantitative meter, Sherbindo defines what he means by them. The voice weight on a vowel is determined in three different ways. There is a dwelling of the voice, or there is its rapid passing. That difference decides its natural length. It creates the inherent or intrinsic long or short. For example, several long vowels occur in this line, especially near the end, to house God's joy in things space gave wide room. House, joy, space, gave, wide, room. In all of these, the vowel is inherently long. By way of contrast, in this line, all of the vowels are short, resulting in a much quicker movement, the rapid footsteps of her fantasy. The second element of the rhythm of English poetry, further enhancing its variety and subtlety, is stress. Trivindo clarifies what he means by this term. There is, again, a vertical ictus weight of the voice, the hammer stroke of stress on the syllable. That of itself makes even a short vowel syllable metrically long. The effect of this vertical stroke falling on both short and long vowel syllables can be illustrated by a line that describes the awakening of Savitri's inner strength in the moment in her, of her confrontation with death. It bore the stroke of that which kills and saves. Here the A of that and the I of kills are inherently short vowels, yet they are weighted as strongly as the long vowels by the stress that falls on them. The hammering effect of stress on short and long vowel syllables alike is seen also in the more irregular rhythm of this line. The great hammer beats of a pent-up world heart. But yet again, Sri continues, there is a third factor of length determination. There is consonantal weight a lingering or retardation of the voice compelled by a load of consonants, 
or there is a free, unencumbered light movement. A vivid case of the retardation of the voice by a load of consonants occurs in the account of a nightmarish experience in Ashwapati's descent into night. Gripped, strangled by that lusting, viscous blot, The agony evoked by the words gripped and strangled is prolonged by the clusters of consonants surrounding the short vowels. On the other hand, no such clusters slow down the line, hurried into unimaginable depths. Here we see what Sherbino means by a free, unencumbered light movement. All three factors, inherent vowel length, distribution of stress, and weight of consonants, figure in Sri Bindo's comments on a line in the second canto. This truth broke in in a triumph of fire. In one of his letters on Savitri, Sri Bindo explains the unusual rhythm of this line, mentioning both vowel length and stress. The scansion is iam, reversed spondy, pyrrhic, trochi, iam. By reversed spondy, I mean a foot with the first syllable long and highly stressed, and the second stressed but short, or with the less heavy ictus. He then identifies the roles played by vowel length and stress in producing different effects in the two halves of the line. In the first part of the line, the rhythm is appropriate to the violent breaking in of the truth, while in the second half it expresses a high exaltation and exaltation in the inrush. This is brought out by the two long and highly stressed vowels in the first syllable of triumph and in the word fire, which in the elocution of the line have to be given their full force. Finally, Sherbino mentions the factor of consonant weight, which has to be taken into account in reading the last three feet. If one slurs over the slightly weighted short syllable in triumph, where the concluding consonants exercise a certain check and delay in the voice, one can turn this half line into a very clumsy double amethyst, the first a glide and the second a stumble. This would be bad elocution and contrary to the natural movement of the words. This detailed analysis by Sherbindu himself shows the minute attention he paid to subtleties of rhythm including factors usually associated with quantitative rather than accentual metrical systems. More generally, he writes in the future poetry, in these highest, intensest rhythms, every sound is made the most of, whether in its suppression or in its swelling expansion, its narrowness or its open wideness. But this is only the technical side. It is not the artistic intelligence or the listening physical ear that is most at work, but something within that is trying to discover a secret of rhythmic infinities within us. It is a labor of the spirit within itself to cast something out of the surge of the eternal depths. What the spirit labors to cast out of the surge of the eternal depths is what the sages of ancient India called the mantra. As I mentioned before, the mantra can be both defined and illustrated by the passage from Savitri we started with, especially the line, sights sound waves breaking from the soul's great deeps. Rhythmically, this line is unusual in that it has no less than seven long vowel syllables, four at the beginning and three at the end, with three unaccented short syllables in between. This creates a contrast between the slow arrival of the sound waves in the first part of the line and their sudden breaking and the rapid swirl of short syllables in the middle of the line. 
followed by a return to the tranquil vastness of the soul ocean from which the next waves will emerge. Sherbindo refers to the same three elements of sight, sound, and soul when he explains the Vedic conception of the mantra. What the Vedic poets meant by the mantra was an inspired and revealed seeing and vision thinking that came on the wings of a great soul rhythm, chandas. For the seeing could not be separated from the hearing. It was one act. Nor could the living of the truth in oneself, which we mean by realization, be separated from either. He continues in the chapter of the future poetry on rhythm and movement, the result is something as near to wordless music as word music can get, and with the same power of soul life, soul emotion, of profound superintellectual significance. In these higher harmonies and melodies, the metrical rhythm is taken up by the spiritual. It is filled with, or sometimes it seems rolled away and lost in a music that has really another unseizable and spiritual secret of movement. It is where the metrical movement remains as a base, but either enshrines and contains or is itself contained and floats in an element of greater music which exceeds it and yet brings out all its possibilities, that the music, fit for the mantra, makes itself audible. It is the triumph of the embodied spirit over the difficulties and limitations of the physical instrument. The advent of the inspiration that brings this higher word music is described in Savitri itself in lines that exemplify the mantric rhythm. Oft inspiration with her lightning feet, a sudden messenger from the all-seeing tops, traversed the soundless corridors of his mind, bringing her rhythmic sense of hidden things. A music spoke, transcending mortal speech. Psychologically, the reception and channeling of such inspiration depends on the emergence of an inner faculty of hearing that is not subject to the limitations of the outer ear. Alluding to the Kena Upanishad, Sri writes, In fact, the word rhythm is only part of what we hear. It is a support for the rhythm we listen to behind in the ear of the ear. Shrotrasya Shrotram. This is the Sanskrit verse he is referring to. Shrotrasya Shrotram, Manaso Manoyad, Vacho Havacham, Saupranasya Pranaha, Chakshushash Chakshur Atibuchadhiraha, Pregyasma Lokar Amrita Bhavanti. That which is hearing of our hearing mind of our mind, speech of our speech, that too is life of our life breath and sight of our sight. The wise are released beyond and they pass from this world and become immortal. The awakening of subtler sense faculties would open up ranges of experience, such as those that are the subject of much of Book Two of Savitri, the Book of the Traveler of the Worlds. This passage, for example, gives a clue to the kinds of experiences Sri was inspired by. He met the forms that divinize the sight, to music that can immortalize the mind and make the heart wide as infinity listened and captured the inaudible cadences that awake the occult ear. Out of the ineffable hush it hears them come, trembling with the beauty of a wordless speech. So far I have talked mostly about rhythm, but that is only one aspect of word music. Poetry uses the sounds of words in ways that can more easily be understood if we do not limit ourselves to a materialistic conception of the nature of language. 
Sri Aurobindo uses the Sanskrit word vak to refer to an alternative view. The words which we use in our speech seem to be, if we look only at their external formation, mere physical sounds which a device of the mind is made to represent certain objects and ideas and perceptions. But if we look at them in their inmost psychological and not solely at their more external aspect, we shall see that what constitutes speech and gives it its life and appeal and significance is a subtle conscious force which informs and is the soul of the body of sound. It is this force, this shakti, to which the old Vedic thinkers gave the name of Vak, the goddess of creative speech. I won't go into the details of Sri Aurobindo's theory of the origins of language, but this statement sums up the essential points that are relevant to poetry. The reason why sound came to express fixed ideas lies not in any natural and inherent equivalence between the sound and its intellectual sense. It started from an indefinable quality or property in the sound to raise certain vibrations in the life soul of the human creature. This must have given early language a powerful life, a concrete vigor, in one direction a natural poetic force which it has lost, however greatly it has gained in precision, clarity, utility. Now, poetry goes back in a way and recovers, though in another fashion, as much as it can of this original element. It does this partly by a greater attention to the suggestive force of the sound, its life, its power, the mental impression it carries. It associates this with the definitive thought value contributed by the intelligence and increases both by each other. Let us look more closely now at this notion of the suggestive force of the sound. In Tribindo's theory, which he worked out partially in an unfinished essay called The Origins of Aryan Speech, the sounds of speech can be traced back to certain seed sounds from which he hypothesized that words evolved by an organic process in the earliest languages. In Savitri also, he refers to the idea of seed sounds. An ear of mind withdrawn from the outward rhymes discovered the seed sounds of the eternal word, the rhythm and music heard that built the worlds. Sherbindo seems to suggest that even the vowels and consonants of modern languages such as English still have some relation to these seed sounds from which words derive the suggestive force of their sound. Poetry tries to make the most of this aspect of language. In Savitri, one of the easiest ways to get a feeling for what Sri Bindu is doing with sound is to take lines in which the same sound is prominently repeated. Such repetition is usually called alliteration when it is consonants that are repeated and assonance when it is vowels. The most obvious case is the alliteration of consonants at the beginnings of the words. But we can start with the effect produced when words begin with vowels. I'm not talking now about assonance, which is the repetition of the same vowel, but even if the vowels are different, the absence of initial consonants often creates a sense of emptiness, as in the line, the objects that to us are empty air. To come to alliteration proper, in the next example, the three initial Bs, one after the other, baffled and beaten back, we labor still, give the impression of blows raining down. Then there is the cacophonous quadruple alliteration of hard Cs in a dissonant clash of cries and contrary calls. The decisive D sound dominates the line 
a daring, a delirium of delight. In contrast, the softness of the fricative F is used to best advantage in faint stumbling breezes faltered among flowers. G's are mixed with liquid and nasal consonants in the radiant line, a glory is the gold and glimmering moon. At the other extreme, in the canto on the world of falsehood, H's are used to convey the mood of terror, which in Sanskrit poetics is called the Bhayanaka Rasa, and horror and the hammering heart of fear. In his depiction of the seasons, the poet introduces spring with an exuberant line whose effect depends partly on the way the tongue leaps from the roof of the mouth in saying the letter L. Then spring, an ardent lover, leaped through leaves. On the other hand, the closure of the mouth involved in pronouncing the letter M can suggest an atmosphere of mystery. This is reinforced by recurrence of the M sound in the alliterative line, the million mystery movement of the one. The consonant P, especially when repeated, can be explosive, as in this line from the canto called The Descent into Night, some passion and power and acrid point of life. Or take the depiction of the distorted figure of God seen in the equally dark canto that follows, revered by the racked wretchedness he had made. Here the impression of wretchedness is intensified by the recurrence of initial R's in an accelerating movement. S is classed phonetically as a sibilant consonant. Tribuner uses the word sibilant itself in an alliteration of S's in his vivid description of the monsoon. Then all was a swift stride, a sibilant race. The sharp T's of the line tortured herself and torturing by her touch, together with the sticky ch sounds, heightened the poignant evocation of nature's nightmare change described in this passage. In a very different mood in the Book of Yoga, when Savitri's sense of separate existence is dissolved in the realization of nirvana, what remains is only a vanishing vestige, like a violet trace. Finally, in the canto on the glory and the fall of life, the self-abandon with which the cosmic life force manifests herself on her own plane is expressed through the unrestrained alliteration of W's in the line, at will she wove her wizard wonder dance. Of course, alliteration is only part of the technique of Savitri, and it is not usually carried as far as in the, as in the lines I've chosen as examples. Shrabindo enumerated several aspects of the technique of the kind of blank verse he was writing and commented on his approach to technique as such. Variations of rhythm as between the lines of caesura, of the distribution of long and short clipped and open syllables, manifold combinations of vowel and consonant sounds, alliteration, assonance, etc. These are the important things. But all that is usually taken care of by the inspiration itself, for as I know and have the habit of the technique, the inspiration provides what I want according to standing orders. I may add that the technique does not go by any set mental rule, for the object is not perfect technical elegance according to precept, but sound significance filling out word significance. If that can be done by breaking the rules, well, so much the worse for the rule. Shurabindo was keenly aware of the qualities of the different consonants and vowels that form the building blocks of words. He used these sounds for their suggestive force, 
but also wove them in intricate patterns of sheer word music. All this belongs to the technical side of poetry. On the other hand, it cannot be reduced to mere technique. As for technique, Shurabindo wrote in a letter, there is a technique of this higher poetry, but it is not analyzable and teachable. One must have the inner sight and inner ear for these things. One must be able to hear the sound meaning, feel the sound spaces with their vibrations. In this technique, it must be the right word and no other, in the right place and in no other, the right sounds and no others, in a design of sound that cannot be changed even a little. Another letter on technique refers to the need to vary the structure of the lines so as to avoid the monotonous, vapid wash that English blank verse can easily become. To give an idea of what some of these line structures might look like, I will conclude this talk with a few examples of basic patterns of alliteration and assonance that occur in a variety of forms in sonetry. Some of the simplest of these can be represented by the formulas AABB, ABAB, and ABBA. In this line near the end of the first canto, at the somber center of the dire debate, the alliteration of the pairs of words somber center and dire debate reinforces the symmetry of the two halves of the line. A similar structural effect is produced by a combination of the assonance of short U's and I's and the alliteration of L's in this line in the next canto, but one stood up and lit the limitless flame. A highly alliterative instance of this pattern is found on the first page of the Book of the Traveler of the Worlds in plots of pain and dramas of delight. In contrast, in the line, a ripple on a single sea of peace. The assonance of short eyes and long e's is interwoven with the alliteration of the soft consonants L and S. Here is another example of the use of assonance in an AABB structure. His light inspires the eternal word. The ABAB pattern of alliteration can be illustrated by a line in the passage on inspiration, which we encountered earlier. A music spoke transcending mortal speech. The line about plots of pain and dramas of delight, which I quoted a moment ago as an example of the AABB pattern, is immediately followed by a striking instance of the ABAB pattern the wonder and beauty of her will to be. Another highly alliterative example is hunting for pleasure in the heart of pain. Assonance of long eyes and short knees plays a similar structural role in the line, her giant energy tied to petty forms. In another case of this pattern, the parallelism of two grammatically similar phrases is reinforced by vowel assonance. It plans without thinking, acts without a will. The ABBA pattern offers further possibilities of variation in the design of sound, as in this line about the invisible potency of the past. It bore the future on its phantom breast. This mirror-like pattern occurs again in the rich alliteration of the blaze of godlike thought and golden bliss. 
Assonance can create a similar effect, as we see in the choreography of the line, these static objects in the cosmic dance. Assonance and alliteration can also be combined as in a scout of victory in a vigil tower. A final example among many others that could be given is life is a marvel mist, an art gone wry. In speaking of the technique of solitary, one has to keep in mind Sherbindo's own statement. Do not forget that solitary is an experiment in mystic poetry, spiritual poetry cast into a symbolic figure. Done on this scale, it is really a new attempt and cannot be hampered by old ideas of technique, except when they are assimilable. The attempt at mystic spiritual poetry of the kind I am at demands above all a spiritual objectivity, an intense psychophysical concreteness. According to certain canons, there should be a subtlety of art not displayed but severely concealed. Summa ars est celare artem. Very good for a certain standard of poetry, not so good or not good at all for others. I cannot bring out the spiritual objectivity if I have to be miserly about epithets, images, or deny myself the use of all available resources of sound significance. In writing his epic, Sherbindo put all the resources of sound significance available in the English language at the service of his poetic and spiritual inspiration. I have pointed out some of the most obvious ways in which he has done this. But every line of the poem has its own word music, whether or not it can be analyzed. If one is simply aware of the sound of the words when reading it, the mantric power that Sherbindo has packed into solitary is sure to have an effect on our consciousness.